Hey guys, welcome back to Gospel and Survival. Today our lesson is going to be cultivating the fear of the Lord in the secret place. So when I say secret place, what's that mean to you, Ethan? Well, uh, secret place to me usually means, you know, you'd go into uh, a place where you could be alone and kind of just be with the Lord, mm -hmm. whether that be in the woods or maybe just locked up in your room or yep. uh, sometimes even in your car. Yeah, right? I mean, so anywhere secret to where you can just really focus and be alone with the Lord, and uh, that's probably the most common understanding of what that means, right? Yeah. Now, we know I've put a man in a prayer shawl on this because a tallit or a prayer shawl was known back then in the first century as a prayer closet. So when it says go into your closet and do what your, yeah. uh, you know, pray to your father, that would be the tallit, the little tent. So a tallit means little tent. It was a closet that they could put over themselves. You'd actually grab the wings of it and pull it down, hmm. and you would pray to the Lord in secret. So that was the idea. Now, of course, Jesus yeah. called out the teachers of the law that would go on the street corners, and they'd have these gigantic yeah. prayer shawls, you know, like hoopas for weddings. They'd just wear them and just make a big show of it, and they'd get yeah. loud and emotional under it and all this stuff. So we've seen that. Yeah. You know, we know people that do that <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And uh, that's yep. kind of what it's talking about. But there is still a deeper meaning that we want to get into. So without wasting time, let's hit Proverbs 9.10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now think about that for a minute. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So what is the fear of the Lord? Without getting too... I know you understand what the fear of the Lord is, mm -hmm. but explain it in a nutshell, if you will. Um, well, I'd say the fear of the Lord is uh, you fear going to hell, so you keep His commands. Yeah, pretty simple, right? Yeah. So if you fear God, and the most common definition that we are familiar with in church settings is when you say the fear of the Lord, that means you you have a reverence for the Lord, you respect Him, you honor Him, and you have you put Him up high and lift it up. Yeah. Right. So you have this reverential awe of God. Yeah. And people kind of limit it to that, but that is not really all that means. If you truly held God in reverence and respect and everything else. Uh, you'll have fear, but out of that fear, you'll be obedient. And yeah. that's the major disconnect that we have. Because people demonstrate they do not fear God yeah. because they are not obedient to what He asks us to do. Yeah, definitely. When we're obedient, so we could say the obedience of the Lord, or obedience to the Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. That's just the beginning. Yeah. So when you can do what God says, that means you're just getting the beginning stages of wisdom. Yep. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So the more you know the Lord, the yeah. knowledge of the Lord and intimacy you gain. Yeah, the more by spending of a time. good relationship you have. Yes, the better relationship, the more you're going to understand Him. Yeah. And that makes sense, yep. right? And that's what it's all about. And that's what really the secret place is all about is gaining that intimacy, relationship, and understanding. Yeah. So, what is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord isn't to be afraid of God, but to be a, afraid to be away from God. And that's John Bevere. John Bevere, yeah. of course, one of our favorite speakers and authors, wonderful man. Um, and I think that really just sums it up. The fear of the Lord isn't about being afraid of Him, because He's high and lifted up and we, we're, we stand in awe. But yeah. it's afraid, being afraid of being apart from Him. We don't yeah. want to be separated from God. How do we pray without ceasing? How do we keep our mind focused on Him throughout the day? Yeah. You know, that's a big thing. Christians uh, today are like, how do you pray as much as you do? How do you pray without ceasing? Oh, well, it's pretty easy. You know, I go into the secret place and that's all I dwell on. You know, you, you dwell on the things in the secret place. And we're going to get into this a little bit more. Um, and... 
I'm going to share some personal accounts and, and testimony regarding my secret place experiences and how it may help build people up. But Matthew 6.6 6 says, and this is Jesus saying all this, it says, but as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Now, we understand that whatever we do in secret in our prayer time will be rewarded openly and in front of others. So basically, our prayer lives will determine how others see God operate in our lives. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. So, keywords: your inner room, your door, your father. Your father who sees what's done in secret. Now... I had a time in my life, if you ever read The Gospel of Survival, my latest book, I explained in detail about my personal prayer experience. I'd been in ministry for a few years. Um, we were really struggling with some things. And I went and knelt down to pray that one night. And I just said, Lord, you got to teach me how to pray because I obviously don't know. And then I, I would always put my elbows in my chair and I'd kind of just lean over my chair like this and just kind of get after it, start talking to the Lord, and I always talked out loud. I still do. I, I just talk to God like we're talking here. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much how I do it. Not all the time because my mind's always yeah. it, always, always focused on Him, and you know, there's times I don't. I woke up this morning praying and talking yeah. to the Lord, and I, I was asleep, you know, but I'm just yeah. having a full-on conversation. I wake up in the middle of a conversation, I'm like, well, that's that's different. So, but that happens too. But anyway, I knelt down to pray that night. It was probably 10, 11 o'clock at night. And um, I said that, and I'm just sitting there, and I was just kind of waiting. You know, all right, Lord, teach me. So now I'm, yeah. I'm waiting. Um, and it seemed like minutes, a few minutes went by, and then there's a peck at the door, and it was Mom. So Robin knocked on the door and asked me if I was ready for lunch. Well, then I get aggravated. Now she's interrupted. Now nothing's happening. What are you doing? What are you talking about? To me, it's like midnight, 11.30 midnight, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and she's knocking on the door. She's like, you've been in there talking all night long. What are you doing? <laughs> no idea. So it was noon the next day, and I was late for church. I had to go back. So I had an encounter with the Lord that I knew nothing about. And I had entered into a realm of total, total misunderstanding. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I entered that realm of the Spirit in that secret place. Yeah. And this, my office at that time, I've always had an office at home. And uh, my office at that time was at the back of your closet in your room. It was like literally uh, five foot <laughs> wide and seven and a half feet long, and it was like a little prison cell, and I had a door on there, <laughs> yeah. and I, I got to the point to where I was screwing the door shut every night. I had big four-inch long screws, and I just screw it in. I had a drill, bzz, 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 screw it shut, so I could not be interrupted, nor could I escape, because what was going to happen in there, I, I didn't know, but I came full of expectation. So that next day, I go to church, I tell everybody what happened, of course, I'm an idiot. Oh, you're a radical. You're weird. Whatever. Pastors totally blew me off. We yeah. go out that day, did our thing, came back home that night. So I hadn't slept that I knew of. Yeah. You know, I just experienced an acceleration of time, you know, yeah. in the spirit there. And anyway, went back and I was like, all right, Lord, I don't know what happened. But, and then I'm just sitting here talking. I come to the office, unload, and I shut the door. And when I shut the door, the Holy Spirit swept my leg. He was waiting on me to ambush me, and he was just like, here you go. And then I was just like, the weight and the presence of the Lord just like forced me to my face. And there was two months of that, two straight months of praying eight, 12, or more hours every single day where I could not escape the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And what I did in that time is it, it was always a little different. Yeah. And I'm going to share this so you can under, maybe you'll grasp at some of these straws uh, to help you in your own prayer life. 
it, because it will be different for everybody. Uh, it's totally different for me now. I can't even do what I used to do. It's just different. Um, sometimes I would have a scripture laid out in my heart because we'd go do evangelism all day or we're praying for people going to hospital, nursing home, visiting, yeah. whatever we were doing that day. And so I'd have a lot on my mind. So maybe I'd come and read a scripture and I'd start reading some scripture and just talking to the Lord. Well, Lord, like I'm just open here, I'm on Job, you know, and it says, uh, listen closely to what I'm saying. The one consolation you can give me, bear with me and let me speak. After I've spoken, you may resume mocking me. So this is just Job and his friends that are, you know, talking about the complaints and things like that. And I might read a simple passage like that, and, and I just ask, well, Lord, will you kind of reveal that to me, and can we have a conversation about this? And so that's how it would begin. I would, I would ask, and I would shut up and wait for the answer. And yeah. sometimes I'd be led to another scripture that revealed the answer or gave me a nugget of insight. And then um, there were other times to where I would just have this mode of like, man, the, the Lord was so good and the, His presence was so tangible today. I just want to go and adore Him and worship Him and just love on Him. And um, I'd turn on some worship music and I would just praise Him, tell Him how much I love him, loved Him and appreciated everything. And I'd pray for people and things like that. And um, that that would go on for hours at, at times, and then you'd hit a hit. I'd hit a stage to where I call it soaking, to where you felt the presence of God in the room. The atmosphere would change. It'd be damp. Uh, there'd be a fragrance in the room, so you know the presence of the Lord is there. And I'd just go quiet. I didn't want to disrupt yeah. any of that. I didn't want to offend Him in any way with my stupidity of saying anything or or, or asking a question. I just wanted to be there and rest in his presence. And this was an all-night thing. I wasn't sleeping. I was entering into the presence of God, and I'd do my thing, and I was resting. And um, suddenly what happened is we began having pointed conversations of, hey, do you know that I'm displeased with this practice in the church? Uh, do you know that this is not of me? Well, Lord, I learned in college that this is why we do it. And, you know, am I going to argue? No. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Lord, I fear you enough to where I, I trust what you're saying is true, so now I have to find it. And sure enough, um, that was the path that led me into a lot of the teachings we started with earlier on, still do, Yeah. Um, things we do now. So that was the beginning of wisdom, things that I was doing in secret. And then it began to be noticed at church. I'd yeah. start coming to church, and I was standing up in the middle of services correcting the pastor. They're misquoting, <laughs> they're explaining yeah. things wrong, and I'd just be, hey, what you mean, pastor, right, is this, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks, brother. S sit down. You know, it was a yeah. lot, a lot of that. It kind of was <laughs> embarrassing. But um, they started requesting me to speak more, yeah. and they would come, and there was a lot of spiritual power that was uh, a side effect of the time spent with the Lord. Yeah. Um, we get caught up in seeking the signs and superpowers of Christianity. We want to cast out devils, heal the sick, you know, all these kind of wonderful things. Those are side benefits. Yeah. Those are the evidences of having spent time in the secret place with the Lord. And that's where we got to get to. So, let me back up because this is a tough one. And I know you cannot see all this very well, but... Um, I'm going to show you the Greek translation because we're getting into the secret place and I talked about how initially I went into my prayer closet. Yeah. Literally a closet. I, zipped, I zapped it in with screws. I wasn't escaping. Um, we talked about the tallit being a type of prayer closet, yeah. but we're going to get into the real deal. What it says literally in Greek. And this is it. When you break this down in Greek, Okay, and I'm not, I'll, I can read it. Sude hotan prosake, eislethe este tuemion, soko klesia ten thoranso prosexia to patre. So basically, what this means is you yet, whenever you are praying, be entering into the storeroom of yourself and locking the door of yourself to pray to the Father. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, I haven't spoken mm -hmm. Greek in obviously a long time. If you Greek scholars, feel free to 
say, wow, you were bad. That's fine. I agree. <laughs> it's been way too long. So anyway, whenever you're praying, be into coming into the storeroom. Enter into your storeroom. Who's yours? Yeah. Okay. Lock the door of your storeroom. And then pray to the Father. That's weird. Doesn't really jive so much when we just read it like this, right? When you go go into the inner your, your inner room, well, it yeah. says it. So what is our inner room? Our storehouse. Yeah. Right. Enter into our inner room. So it's something inside of us that we don't realize is already there. Interesting. And when we close that door, what does that mean? If you go into this. To an inner room in yourself and you close the door, what are you doing? You're getting rid of all external distraction. Yeah, you're closing yourself off from everything. Exactly. Focusing. All Focus time. in, yeah, dialed in. Yeah. And for me, at one time, that came into a literal room and it required me to literally focus in. Yeah. And for I couldn't even escape. And that's the type of a action that he wants us to do. So put away your phone, turn it off, no computer, uh, nothing but you and, the, you and the Lord. And have the word, obviously. Don't go anywhere unarmed without your sword, right? Take the sword, of the sword of the Lord, the word of God. And it's just you and the Lord in a room or by yourself somewhere, anywhere, in your car, in the yeah. woods, wherever. Blocked off from everything at external. So that's what we're doing. But there's a storehouse there. So, here's the Greek. Luke 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart. Hmm. Good treasure of heart. I know in other scriptures it says there's a storeroom in heaven full of treasure. Yeah. Interesting. Where's the kingdom of heaven? At hand. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the good treasure of our heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Interesting. Yeah. So we get these people that uh, talk themselves down. It's one to be self-deprecating, you know, kind of poke fun at yourself a little bit, you know. Yeah. I enjoy that. You know, it's, I think it's humorous. Yeah. Um, but there is another thing entirely to totally, well, you know, I don't believe in healing because I could never do that. I could never do that to somebody. Yeah. Well, you won't. Out of the abundance of your storehouse, you're speaking. So your storehouse in that realm is empty. Yeah. So you're talking smack. Well, so-and-so, you're judging everybody else. Um... I don't like their religion because they believe this, and I it, the, I don't see it in the Word. I don't see it happening. I think all that stopped. Uh, yeah, for you it did because your storehouse is again empty. Yeah, you, you that's not available to you, and we have to get into the good treasure of your heart. Now the Bible also says that God sees the evilness of a heart, and our heart does nothing but lie. It's desperately wicked. That's yeah. true. Uh, when we're talking in the flesh. But the good treasure of the heart, you could also say storehouse in this regard, yeah. brings forth good and evil all the same. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now people also get caught up thinking that if you cuss a lot or you tell dirty jokes or whatever, and that there's some of that. Cussing, we'll do another topic on that because <laughs> all the words we say either didn't exist uh, in Bible times, or they are actually in the Bible, and they're said in the Bible, and they're used frequently. So we have this pre-World War II mentality of we got to clean up our act, and that's carried on. So things are profane and blasphemous aren't necessarily what we call cuss words. They're actually much more common everyday words that God actually doesn't want us to say at all. Side quest over, back to this. Yeah. <laughs> so... What you're speaking, the things that you can or cannot do, things like that. That's, that's what we're addressing. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So that's something we see a lot. We see yeah. religious people 
Uh, they say religious things, but truly, they're not entering into the secret place. Yeah, it's uh, like how everyone says, well, I believe in Jesus, or wherever the case may be. But yeah. I'm spiritual, but not religious. Yeah. It, you know, a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Honoring them with their lips, their hearts are not are far from them. Yeah. The Lord sees not as a man sees, but looks on... Uh, who look, a man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's 1 Samuel 16, 7. Yep. So the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord is looking at what's in your storehouse. So we're only going to basically understand if the Lord's looking on our heart and the Lord knows whether their hearts are far from Him or not. When He's looking, He's simply looking in that heavenly treasury the storeroom in heaven we hear a lot of preachers talking about this all the time yeah you know they say well i've seen this heavenly storehouse full of riches and all these blessings and abundance and all those great things yes for some yeah because as a man thinketh in his heart so is he out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks if you enter into the time of prayer in that secret place, you want to enter into your heart. Enter into that secret place of the heart where you envision yourself walking with God, praying and laying hands on the sick and seeing people recover, raising people from the dead. All these things, that the best of the best things that you envision for your life your family, your friends. It's in that secret, intimate place that we are to pray from to our Father. Mm -hmm. A little deep, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. There, at times, is a ramp to get up into that place. There is a point to where you just abide in that place. Yeah. Abide in me as I abide in my Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. So there's a point at which you're just like, it's here, it's always accessible, I can pull from it at will, and we just rock on. But to keep that storeroom full, it's like rotating your preps, yeah. right? Some go out, you got to put some back in. How do you get more back in? Go back to the secret place. Do inventory. Yeah. Lord, I'm here again. I'm here to pray, I'm here to commune, I'm here to worship, I'm here to love. And what are we doing today? Todd White says he like he's a strong believer of the tithe, right? And he likes to tithe every day 10% of the day to the Lord. So when you think of that, he says yeah. 2.4 hours a day he tithes to the Lord. Yeah. Great place to start. And, you know, that's what he says. That's a great place to start. Above that is offerings, right? Giving offerings to the Lord. Yeah. How do you pray two hours a day or spend two and a half hours a day, roughly, with God? Well, I mean, how do we do it? What do you do? I know what you do. Yeah. What do you do? Um, I mean, I feel like... Two and a half hours honestly doesn't seem like anything. You know, <laughs> right. yeah. uh, you could do so many things. Whether that just be mm -hmm. um, praying, listening, listening to worship music, or mm -hmm. just reading your Bible, yeah. or just sitting there being quiet, praying. You know, right. just or listening, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, there's a lot you can do, and once you start doing that, time just flies by real quick. Yeah. Because. Um, Sometimes whenever I'm reading my Bible, it feels like I'm just, like, read through a couple chapters and it's been two hours already. I was yeah. like, damn, do I read that slow? <laughs> or, <laughs> right. or am I just actually sitting here trying, understanding it all? Right. You know, because sometimes it's better to take things slow instead of how most of us like to speed read, you know, yeah. through just things. Just power through it. Yeah. Yeah. And, but whenever you sit there and take the time to, like say every word like I like to just read it out loud most of the time mm -hmm. because it's like you're speaking the word of God yeah so it's better to 
have that out in the open. Also helps you remember it a lot better too. I, I do the same thing. Yeah. When you speak it out loud, you can remember. It's like when I meet people. If I don't say their name, I'm gonna forget it in yeah, thirty seconds. The same way. <laughs> but I'll say it out loud. I got it. It's unlocked. Yeah. You know, that's great because I, I, I speak the word out when I read it, especially if it's a harder uh, understanding or a hard section of Scripture. Yeah, that's where I feel that I need some reinforcement. If I speak that out into the atmosphere, I'm putting all hell on notice, and the devil's like f fled already. You know, they don't want to be around hearing that stuff, but I'm making it active in my life, Yeah, you know, and giving it power over me. So... Back to this, two and a half hours to build that storehouse treasury back up. Isn't that big a deal? Yeah. So, you know, we're in a unique position. We, you know, we live together. We work together. Um, we're yeah. self-employed, so we're really blessed in that regard. Yeah. But you travel to work every day. Some or people travel to work every day. You can listen to the bi audio Bibles. Just yeah. ingest the Word. Ingest Jesus all day. If you're listening to the Word, you listen to King James Version and Amplified and uh, get the listen to the ones that are acted out, you know, word for word. There's a lot of good Gospel of John movie. That's how I memorized the Gospel of John, yeah. <laughs> was I watched that movie. It, went, it was a word for word translation, and it was acted out. But seeing the visual, I'm visual, I've said this a million times, I'm a seer yeah. prop type prophet. I, am, I see things in that regard. So yeah. I... I'm very visual, so when I can put pictures and context to the Word, yeah. it's locked in. And I would watch it every single day, sometimes twice a day, or I'd have it playing behind me as I'm working or writing something else. And it just became a fabric of who I am. Yeah. So I, that's one of my favorites. You know, that's my favorite. You know, <laughs> it's the Gospel of John and First John, Second John. Yeah. You know, I know those. So here's here's the thing. We're... Out of that storehouse, we're going to deal with religious people. I don't like religious people, Ethan. They bug me. All right? <laughs> and a person with a religious spirit is one who uses God's word to execute their own will, yeah. to excuse their lack of obedience, or to manipulate others to achieve their own end. So when you get religious people that honor God with their lips, but you know their storehouses are empty, their hearts are far from them. They are going to use religion to manipulate, to control, or to achieve, or excuse themselves. So they're the ones that Jesus said uh, they need to pluck the log out of their eye before they pull the splinter out of yeah, you their, know, brother's their brother's eye. Yeah. So basically the, the, hip, the most hip... What, what, what am I thinking? Yeah, of? I mean, don't <laughs> be yeah, don't be I mean, hypocritical. I can say to, a lot of mean things. Yeah. I don't want to. The Pharisees yeah. of of modern Christianity, yeah. the legalistic religious spirits that have religious knowledge, hypocritical in the way they live. There is no obedience, and what little obedience or aversion of obedience they've built up in their mind. And honestly, it's self-deception. Yeah. You know, they a say, lot of the time, yeah. A lot definitely. of it's self-deception. They they have a form of godliness, but deny its power. But deny the power that could set them free. They could they have this form of religion and obedience to the word as it was told, taught as they choose to believe it. Yeah. But it's in direct contradiction to the word. Contradiction to the word. So these are the people with the religious, we just say it's a religious spirit or a Pharisee, legalistic, we use different terms, right? Mm -hmm. However, open the door of your heart to him and he will enter and dine with you. Revelation 3.20. If you'll simply open the door, he'll come and dine with you or abide with you. How do we enter into that place? I talked about the ramp of building up to get in. Yeah. Initially, for me, as I said, that started with, Lord, teach me how to pray. Then it became, uh, Lord, what are we going to do today? Worship yeah. music, reading the Bible. I'll be honest, I got so radical, I'd just say, Lord, I don't understand it, and I'd put it on my head, 
and I just say download it because I'm too stupid to understand this. So um, I spent 13 years in Bible colleges and seminaries and then taught during that time in Bible colleges and seminaries. Yeah. And I've had to forget or throw away a, a great majority of that information taught and told to me. I don't even bring it up or talk about it. Because it was based on tradition. Yeah. It was based on man's interpretation and everything else. And it was in such direct opposition to what the plain Word of God says that I couldn't use it. Yeah. When I was going through my master's degree, and Robin told me to bring this up, I that's when the Lord was speaking to me regarding holiday observances and many other things that we do in the church that are in direct opposition to the plain teaching of the Word of God. Yeah. And when I would bring these things up to them and challenge instructors or professors, well, this is the way we do it. We, we accepted this, and this is just long done, or this is the way our denomination does it. I was like, well, I don't care. I didn't get a vote. And God certainly didn't because it's in direct opposition to this. Yeah, exactly. So it was a big challenge for me. By the time it came to defend my dissertation, it was on pagan origins of the Christian holidays yeah. in, a, in a very denominational, <laughs> robe-wearing church and denomination. Yeah. That went over like a lead balloon. You know, <laughs> So that was a battle. But they couldn't. They yeah. had, they couldn't do anything about it. They knew. Yeah, you're right. But we choose to do this. Yeah. That's why you're not seeing intimacy with the Lord. You're relying on religion. I've I fought. I had to fight myself to open the door of my heart, so that I could abide with Him, and receive the knowledge of who He really is. And that's yeah. really what it boiled down to. It was an internal battle, the battlefield of the mind. We had to, uh, you know, there's a lot of scripture about the renewing of, the, of your mind yeah. to the Word of God. So that's where it, of course, began. And then it was about getting in the secret place and fighting. It wasn't a fight initially. Now it's a fight. As I've gotten older and gotten away from that, I entered a time where I went many years without really praying at all. Yeah. Not that I would call it praying as we think of. Yeah. Now I'm at a place to where I feel guilty, and I know that's just from the enemy. You know, it's external guilt, like, oh, yeah. I haven't put in any job. I'm literally eight, seven, eight hours a day, every day. I'm reading, I'm writing, I'm studying, I'm dwelling mentally, I'm praying, I'm talking to the Lord. It's just, it's like praying without ceasing. Yeah, you do it without thinking about without it. Without even thinking about it. I don't even think about it at this point. It's just who I am. Yeah. Um, I don't believe in God. I know Him. Yeah. So I don't need to have to fight my way in. It's like last time we went out and did street ministry. Yeah. You know, it was just like, you, it's always accessible. We didn't have to turn anything on. Yeah. You know, it's just like, okay, we're going to go and do this. Yeah. So basically, where we're at is... When we cultivate the fear of the Lord, we're cultivating our obedience and dependence upon intimacy with Him. We're being afraid not to be with Him, or we're afraid of being separated from Him. Yeah, um, this comes to mind, uh, something I was talking to one of my friends the other day, it was about, uh, you know, you whenever you aren't filled with the Spirit or in God's presence, you have like this empty spot that mm -hmm. you just need to fill it with something. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when people fall into the way of the world or yeah. they fall into the way of evil spirits mm -hmm. or things like that to try and fill that void because mm -hmm. there's only, that void is the, only God can fill it, you yeah. know. Only Jesus can go in there and fix what's broken and mm -hmm. uh, heal the void within you because we all feel that at some point in our lives where we're sitting there just going through life and you just say something's missing there's mm -hmm. just something missing mm -hmm. and it just means you're missing god yeah you know? i mean that's what it, that's what it amounts to yeah and how people we're not teaching effectively in the church 
how to enter into that communal yeah. communal relationship. Yeah. And uh, for example, we can look at Moses, or we can look at Abraham. You know, Abraham. Nobody knew God until Abraham first heard him. Right? Abraham heard God and said, "Hey, you're going to have a child." You know, it, he's ninety something years old at this yeah. point. And he was like, "Okay." He believed it. The child comes. And then after he has the child, he says, I want you to take the child out into the wilderness and kill this child and give it to me as a sacrifice unto me. Abraham didn't question. He just said, okay. Yeah. What? Radical, right? Yeah. He goes out there takes his child out into the wilderness. They built the altar to sacrifice him on together, presumably. Yeah. Um, he bound his hands, put him on the altar, lifted the knife. Yeah. He was doing it without question or hesitation as far as we can read yeah. and then an angel came down to stop it and said hey you've demonstrated that you fear the Lord you respect and will obey even when it's difficult and uncomfortable when you don't understand and when it is not to your benefit yeah that is a demonstration of the fear of the Lord yeah I mean that's having faith right yeah there. exactly that is faith Moses. Moses had one encounter with the Lord. Yeah. Seen him in a burning bush. Changed his life forever. He goes back. And what did he tell Pharaoh five different times? We want to go into the wilderness to yeah. worship the Lord. We want to go in the wilderness to worship the Lord. We want to go. And Moses wanted to take the people to where he met God and had the encounter. Yeah. That was the goal initially. And we're told in Exodus 19 that... God delivered them unto himself so they could have the encounter the same way Moses did. He wanted to be there. He won he loved them. He truly loved them and let them see all this crazy stuff that he had dished out against the Egyptians to free them. And what happened is as they were going. They had seen all these miraculous events and signs yeah. and they heard Moses and Moses' testimony. Yeah. And they complained yep. the entire time. Still well, you know, we, let's go to Egypt, let's go back. You know, it was better there, and they're being led in the daytime by a pillar of fire, and at night, or at night by a pillar of fire, and day by a pillar of smoke. They are seeing the visible presence of God. Yeah. They get to the mountain. They see fire come down on the mountain. And they hear the voice of God collectively, and what do they do? Let's go back to Egypt. This We don't want to hear from this mo guy, Moses. You talk to God. You know, and it says that Moses entered in, drew near to God in fear and trembling. Yeah. He was aware of the holiness and the magnificence of God. And he still drew near because he didn't want to be apart from that. Yeah. While everybody else, even already having experienced the goodness, the greatness, and seeing the majesty of God, still refused the relationship with him. Yeah. The love and kindness of God, and this is something else, the love and kindness of God is, abides in the midst of the fire. You know, you got to go through the scary stuff to get to the good stuff. Yeah. You know, and all the good, and all the scary stuff isn't scary. It's just, it's, it's a purification process. Yeah, it's just stepping stones to get to where you need to be. Right. And, you know, it, we talk about uh, being sanctified and holy and set apart, you know, and justified. Justified happened on the cross. We're fully yeah. forgiven. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. Jesus did that on the cross. Yeah. Sanctification is the ongoing process of being made holy, and yeah. that's the part we have to cooperate with. You yeah. know, we can't work against the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's he's working. the hardest part to do. That's the challenge. And by entering into this secret place... And cultivating that oil of intimacy with our Father in, in those quiet times where we go into deep within ourselves, uh, be it in the woods, in our car, or here in an office, or whatever, you know, or if yeah. we're locking ourselves in a little closet. Um, cultivating that relationship to where we develop that sense of, hey, I can do all things through Christ. I am the head and not the tail. God has appointed a ministry and a plan and a purpose for my life. I am to go and share my faith, to lay hands on the sick, to see them recover, to cast out devils, to raise the dead, to do all the works appointed to Jesus. If Jesus can do it, Ethan can do it. If Jesus can do it, Jason can do it. So that's how we walk 
We are to walk as He walked on the earth. And it's only, that's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of understanding of who He is. It says that as we draw near, He'll hit a point to where He no longer, no longer calls us servants, but calls us friends. And that is the majority of what, it's a protection measure, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we all do it. We're servants unto God until we become His friend. And yeah. we cannot become His friend until He knows us and until He knows He can trust us. Yep. You know, we see that repeated throughout the Scripture. Yeah. So do we want to have the depth of intimacy to where we are a friend of God? Absolutely. That's where we want to be. To, um, to where we are obedient when we don't understand it. When it doesn't make sense. When it could hurt us in a worldly sense. Yeah. Um, we want to be instantly obedient. And I always say delayed obedience is disobedience. Right? Yeah. And I know there are times we enter willingly into rebellion. We just don't want to do it. Because the the quick fix of sin, be it lust or um, masturbation, or if it's drug use, um, fornication, you know, that that eight, ten second quick fix we get, you know, yeah. of that dopamine dump in our brain, you know, we need to be able to fight the flesh and master that. That's part of that sanctification. He always yeah. gives us a way of escape, right? Yep. Look at uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. She was attacking him and trying to get a hold of him. She grabbed his shirt and was trying to pull him into bed at this point. You know, and what he did, ran for his life. Sometimes you just got to stop and run. So yeah. when those feelings come, be it drugs, porn, um, whatever your vice is, whatever your pet sin is or thing you struggle with is, when you just want to talk mad trash or get in a fight or stir up trouble, whatever that thing is that you would know, run. He says he'll, he always gives us an exit. Yeah. Just get up and leave. Don't be afraid. Who cares what the world says anymore? Who cares? The world's messed up. They can't even decide on what a man and woman is anymore. Yeah, you think the right. world has any good news or information? No, it's it's a joke. So don't listen to that. That little steps of obedience like that progresses your sanctification process, draws you near to God, demonstrates your obe your obedience, and through that you're witnessing the awe and the magnific magnificence of God. Yeah. So that's what it's all about. That's how we're going to cultivate the fear of the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Um, implement some of this information into your own life. Cultivate that fear of God in your life, and you will absolutely grow closer to Him. Yep. Be blessed. See you next time.